now that Carmen has wore them out. <laughs> and she's wore out too, okay. <laughs> Well, good morning, church. It's good to see you guys, and I'm glad to be here. Uh, before I get started today, I want to do something. Um, many of you know of our, our really good friends, uh, Johnny and Ellen Sandusky. Um, so their, uh, one of their daughters, uh, Lisa, has been battling some really, really bad uh, health struggles, and um, so they're not here this morning because uh, they're at home with her, uh, watching over her and stuff. And uh, many, I don't need to probably reiterate everything that's going on. I, I assume that most of you know. Uh, if you don't, just know that, um, that she's battling some things, right? Um, but I want to take just a second this morning um, because I believe that God is powerful. I believe that he's all loving and all knowing and um, he already knows the plan that he has. Um, but I still think it's important for us to intercede on other people's behalf. Um, and I believe that the prayers of the saints uh, gathered together is powerful. Um, so if you would, just for a second, uh, would you stand to your feet and would you reach out your hands to Jesus? And would you take a moment and pray for the Sanduskies? And then I'll close it out. Father, it's a great privilege to be able to come before your throne. So, Father, we come in the name of Jesus the author and the perfecter of our faith, the good shepherd, the true vine, the one that is the way, the truth, and the life. We come to you in Jesus' name on behalf of our uh, dear family, the Sandusky family. We come to you on behalf of Lisa and her family and, and the entire Sandusky family and, and all of them, and we just lift her up to you today, Father, uh, that you um, would shower that family with your grace, that they might in this moment feel your powerful yet still presence. Father, may they be reminded of the love of Christ, how deeply and intimately loved they are. But may they also know, Father, that, that you are a God that cares. So by the power of your Holy Spirit, I just pray that they might feel you today. We're praying for a miracle, Father. But ultimately, we're praying for your glory. that earth might be as heaven. So, Father, by all the prayers of the saints that are gathered this morning, may your will be done and may your love be known. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, so um, I want to thank, just real quick before I get going in my message this morning, I want to thank uh, the Souders and their entire family group uh, for last minute uh, throwing together some meals uh, for the Sandusky family, and, and I believe that they're going to take those after church today, so thank you guys. Uh, for those of you that are in the Souders uh, family group, uh, thank you for uh, doing that, and, and I imagine this week we might... Um, uh, know of some other opportunities on how we can love them and serve them and, and, and show the love of Jesus to them this week in that capacity. So, um, so thank you guys very much. Uh, we are in week five of Made for More. Why don't you just look at your neighbor this morning, if you have one, and just tell them, you were made for more. Look at them and tell them, you were made for more. I don't know about you, but I have really, really enjoyed uh, this series. 
uh, in the book of Ephesians. Because I believe that, uh, that we were made for more because Jesus is more. Um, I had the opportunity this week, um, well, I guess Sunday is the start of a new week, so last week, um, to, uh, to do several things. And I just want to share some of this with you real quick because, uh, because you guys have uh, been knowing my story and knowing uh, my love for Jesus for a long time. And, and I want to share a few things with you that only by the power of Jesus. Now, forgive me if I cry just a little bit here, but seriously, um, I got to do a few things this week that outside of the grace and power of Jesus would never be possible. Um, so the first thing is, is I got to go back to the church where I came to know Jesus, uh, Cowboy Gathering Church and Inola had a had an old-fashioned cowboy tent revival. Um, and uh, anyway, I got to preach four nights there, and, and it was incredible, man. I had such a good time, okay? Uh, there were several hundred people that came in and out over the course of the four days, and, and, I, and I'm excited to share with you. We were privileged to, uh, to get to witness and, and baptize five people uh, that week, and man, it was incredible. Um, but I, I want to tell you something real quick. Uh, you guys know my story, and you know that um, me going into that area is not always super comfortable for me. I kind of have a history there that is not so good. Um, and this week, I got the opportunity to drive around and just pray. Um, so I drove around a couple of my old homes, um, I drove around a couple of the old homes where um, not so good things took place. Um, so I got to uh, drive by homes that um, that I have a very not so great memory of uh, drug dealing in, and I got to pray over so many people. I didn't get to see them face to face, but I got to pray over so many people and their homes that I know are still being held in bondage. Um, so that was really powerful for me to get to experience that. And um, I got to drive by the, the place, um, and it broke my heart uh, this week because you never know what your kids are paying attention to. And... Uh, I've never really told my daughter a lot of my past. But for four nights in a row, she sat on the front row of the revival and listened to every word that I said. And uh, there was, on the very first night, I shared uh, some of my testimony and uh, how I came to know Jesus and I had never told my daughter that there was a time where uh, I didn't have a bed. <laughs> I had never told my daughter that there was a time where I didn't have a home uh, and that I slept outside, you know, um, behind a dumpster. I never told her that. But on the first night, I, I've shared that so many times with so many people. And on the first night, I shared that with everybody that was there. And I said, you know, I just, I stand before you a trophy of God's grace. Only by the grace of God do I have the opportunity to stand in front of you. Because without him, I would either be in prison or I would be dead. So I shared that on Sunday night with the people. And Caitlin was wrestling with Lawton somewhere. And I looked down, and my daughter's just looking up at me with tears in her eyes. And it just reminds me, it just reminds me how important it is 
to raise our children to know the love of Jesus. Because what I had to experience, I don't ever want my kids to experience. So I got to share that, but it didn't stop there. You know, it's not very often when, when I prepare a sermon and I preach a sermon, and then I'm convicted by my own sermon. Like, generally, that happens during the week, right? And, and I'll just break down in tears during the week, and I'm like, well, God, what do you want me to do with that, right? But um, I think it was on Monday night, I preached a sermon and I'm talking about reconciliation, and uh, my mother is there. And many of you know my story and know that I, for a long time now I have not had a terrific relationship with her. And, and she was there, and, and she got to meet my mother-in-law and my father-in-law. And it was a whirlwind of emotion. But in the midst of my sermon, as I'm talking about reconciliation, the Holy Spirit just convicts me. And you guys have heard me talk so often about how the Holy Spirit will just give you gentle nudges. Like, hey, you should probably do this, right? And sometimes he'll nudge you and say, no, you don't need to go right, you need to go left, or vice versa, right? And so in the middle of my sermon, um, on Monday night, I... The Holy Spirit convicted me uh, that I needed to go see my grandparents. Now, you guys know that um, they're a part of a faith system that does not get along real well with my faith system, right? So I have not had the opportunity to really visit with them one-on-one -on -one for a very, very long time. And in the middle of my sermon... I just had this overwhelming sense of just go knock on their door. Oh my goodness, why did I never thought of that before? Of course, I've tried that a million times. But this time was different because it wasn't in my power, it was in his power. So as soon as I was done that night, I petitioned several people and I said, look, God wants me to go visit with them tomorrow. Would you pray for me? And several people showered me in prayer. And the next morning, I, I woke up bright and early. And, and I braved it because I didn't want to waste any time. So I didn't even get to get a cup of coffee in me. <laughs> so I went in cold turkey, guys. <laughs> and... Uh, And I knocked on their door, and we visited for quite some time on the porch. And I'm just praying, God, let them invite me in, you know? Like, I'm not getting... Jesus, if you come up, I'm going to proclaim you boldly, but, but my hope is that I can just reminisce and just talk and just, just visit with them as their grandson, not... Not as a pastor, not as an evangelist, not as any, like, just let me be their grandson for one day. So for almost two and a half hours, I got to sit in their living room and talk about old stories and just reminisce. It was really, really good. Um, but with that, I want to say this. Uh, hopefully I don't do this the whole time because I can't breathe. <laughs> I struggle with really bad allergies and they're really bad right now. That's what's going on. It's not other stuff. I don't know what you guys were thinking. My allergies are just really bad today. <laughs> but I want to make a statement and I want you guys to take this seriously. Um, And I hope and I pray that this, not in a bad way, but in a good way, ruffles your feathers just a little bit. May we all count the cost of what it means 
to follow Jesus. In the Western church, so many of us have never given up anything to follow him. But some of us have. And I want you today to just count the cost of what it means to follow. He's always worth it. I don't, I don't regret for one second ever following Jesus. He's always been loving and gracious and forgiving to me. And he, he's been such a good teacher to me. And he's, he's just always been so good. And reconciling relationships and all of that is even better. But may we all count the cost of what it means to follow Jesus. I want to talk about that just a little bit today as we keep going in Ephesians. But I want to remind us briefly um, what we've talked about over the last couple weeks. Does that sound good? This is going to give me an opportunity to let tears stop flowing and for me to uh, just proclaim boldly the name of Jesus and in his power. So in week one, uh, we've been, walk- well, really all the series, we've been walking through this idea of maybe we were made to do something different than what we're doing, right? Maybe we were made for more. So in week one, we broke down this idea that to, in today's church, a lot of times we're going to try and we're going to try and we're going to push and we're going to push and we're going to try to uh, create ourselves a move of God and, and we're going to make a lot of effort and we're, we're going to do a lot of things to, in order to lift up the name of Jesus. And, and what we talked about that week is maybe it's time, right, to move from more effort to just simply more Jesus. Maybe it's time to not, not necessarily stop trying and, and start uh, stop putting forth effort because I believe that God is going to work in the midst of that. But I think what we've broken down is that a lot of times we think we can do church on our own. And maybe, just maybe, it's time for us to move from more effort to more Jesus. And we looked in Ephesians chapter 1 about how Jesus' plan, right? All authority, and right? All authority means a lot of stinking authority, right? Jesus is all-powerful and all-knowing. And at the end of Ephesians 1, it says that he is going to fill all things with himself. That's a big God, isn't it? If he's going to fill all things with himself. You know, in the Old Testament, they looked at all these things and, and they built temples made with human hands. And they're like, this is where God dwells. But in Ephesians 1, he's saying, no, he's going to fill all things with his glory. And he wants the church to do the same thing. And and what I proclaim to us in week one is that we are never going to fill all things with the church until we move from more effort to more Jesus. We are not powerful enough, but he is. In week number two, we talked about uh, moving from more volunteers to more masterpieces. I think church traditionally uh, has, has said, man, we got a role to fill, will you fill it? we got a role to fill, will you volunteer? we got a role to fill, will you do it, right? And I think in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, what we began to learn is that God uh, has created us in his image. Let me read this to you. Uh, in Ephesians 2, verse 10, it says, For we are God's what? Masterpiece. We are God's masterpiece he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago so it's time for us to move from more volunteers to more masterpieces God in your life has molded you and shaped you and given you certain experiences for you to use as a masterpiece And in week three, Ray did such a good job at at helping us understand that we need to move from more guilt to more love. And uh, the general idea that day uh, was that a a lot of times we're going to try to guilt people into doing things. You're guilty of it. I'm guilty of it. Um, just, just the other day, God convicted me and reminded me of this because we were trying to get Afton to do something and out of my mouth comes, if you don't do this, I'm going to take away blank. 
And what I was reminded of is, oh my goodness, I need to move from more guilt to more love. I don't want to take things away from you. I want to gently love you in a certain direction, not by manipulation, but I want you to follow the narrow path, right? So we need to move from more guilt to more love. Last week, uh, we were in Ephesians chapter 4, and the Apostle Paul tells us uh, that the job of the church is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So last week, I talked about moving from more hierarchy, right, which would be like uh, a democratic republic type uh, scenario. We need to move from more hierarchy to more missionary. Look, listen, we have all been given a mission. What is that mission? To go make disciples, right? It's the only way that the, that the world is ever going to be flipped upside down is if we look at the masterpiece mission that God has given us and if the Lord's army will rise up and do what he has called us to do out of an overflow of love that he has called us to love, then the world will be up, flipped upside down for the glory of God. Amen? And today, uh, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 5. And what I want to talk about today is uh, going from more programs to more mission fields. More programs to more mission fields. When I was in uh, the Air Force, uh, one of my favorite things to do was march. I loved to march. I was really good at it. It's been a long time ago. Actually, I was medically discharged from the Air Force 10 years ago next month. Uh, so it's been a decade since I've practiced or did it, uh, right? But when I was in the Air Force, I loved to march. Like, it was my absolute favorite thing to do. Um, I, I, I was the leader uh, whenever our flight would march out, and, and I got to give the instructions. and it, That was my cup of tea, right, or cup of coffee, right? That was real. I really enjoyed that because, you know, I grew up, uh, and I don't mean to dog my family or anything, that's not what this is, but I grew up without a real great structure. It was a very unstructured home, and we lived in about 450 different places, and it, it was a product of divorce, and, and, and God can use all of that, but I had never had structure. So whenever I went into the Air Force and had structure for the very first time, man, I took to it, uh, oh man, I can't believe I almost said this, but I'm not, you don't know what I was going to say, but I do, and the Lord's going to forgive me right now. Uh, because it crossed through my mind. Okay, uh, I'm not going to share it. You're not going to talk me into it. Um, but it's the same way in our spiritual life. At one time, we were marching to old orders. Because the world is telling us to march one way, and God is gently asking us to march another and if you look at it like marching orders, the world will tell us things like this. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Let's start in verse 1. Let's take a look at God's marching orders versus the world's marching orders. Take a look. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. I think it will be on the screens as well. It says this. It says, imitate God... Therefore, in everything you do, why? Because you are his dear children. Imitate God. You see, whenever I was growing up, I tried to imitate my dad. Am I alone in that? Anybody of you try to imitate your parents? Now, sometimes we can imitate our parents and it'd be a really, really, really good thing. Sometimes we can imitate our parents and it not be a good thing, right? I remember once where um, I learned a new word. I'm not going to tell you the word uh, from this stage, but I learned a new word, and I was proud of this new word. I'd heard this word used a lot, okay? And it was a very simple word. It was only four letters, but, um, but the, uh, the, the word got used so much, and I was like, man, my vocab, my dictionary is growing. Like, I, I know a lot of words now, and I must have been in, like, first grade, second grade, something like this. And it's like, I have got to learn how to use this word in a sentence. What better place to practice using words and sentences 
than in school, right? So I remember very vividly um, that I went to school in an effort to use my new word. It did not go well. (laughs) I believe the principal called my dad and said, you need to come have a talk with your son. Now, at that time, my dad was not very far because he owned a construction business, and my dad was currently, at that time, building a new gymnasium for my school. He was on site. (laughs) So my dad gets called in, and, and he pulls me outside, and he says, what the f*** were you thinking? I said, that's what I said. There's a time to imitate, and there's a time to not imitate. Paul says stuff like this, follow me as I follow Christ. And Paul says this, imitate God in everything that you do. Does that mean that if God's a creative God, we should be a creative people? Yeah. If God is a loving God, should we be a loving people? Yes. If God's a gracious God, should we be a gracious people? Yes. If God's a forgiving God, do you need to forgive your neighbors? Yes. Imitate God, therefore, in everything that you do. Why? Because you are now his children. Paul continues, live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ Jesus. And this was his example to us. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, which was a pleasing aroma to God. Here's our new marching orders. Live a life pleasing to God, full of love. But don't do it out of your own strength. Imitate him. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, He makes that possible. No longer imitate the ways of the world because this is the ways of the world. Are you ready for what Paul says? This is what he says. Verse 3. Let there be no sexual immorality. Let there be no impurity or greed among you. Such sins have, say that with me, no place. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes. Now, don't get me wrong. I love a good joke. But if Paul's telling me to stay away from coarse jokes, maybe at the watering hole at work this week, I shouldn't listen to coarse jokes. Maybe it's time for me to walk away. But for some of us, maybe it's time for you to stop being the one that tells the jokes. I've heard them. You've told them to me. There is no place for this among God's people. He continues. Stay away from obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes. These are not for you. Instead, here's your new marching orders. Let there be thankfulness to God. Let me ask you this question right now. In the next three seconds, what can you thank God for? Do it. Shout it out. What can you thank God for? Amen. Shout it out. What can you thank God for? Amen. Somebody, what can we thank God for? Anything. Your work, your children, your family, your, the roof over your head, your faith, your love, whatever, right? Let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Paul continues, Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse their sins. For the anger of God will fall on all of them who disobey. 
And over the next several verses is what I really want to focus on, but it's not going to take long. I just want to pull a couple truths out of this, okay? Take a look at verse 7. Don't participate in the things that these people do. Verse 8. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have the light from the Lord. He's going to give us an exhortation here, and this is my challenge for us. So live as people of light. I made a Facebook status this week, and most people probably didn't understand it. And it was simple, but it's a deep theological truth. All I said was, I'm not afraid of the dark. You can take that as many ways as you want, but I'm not afraid of the dark. Growing up, I was terrified of the dark. I was terrified of the dark. When I was a kid, I had to take care of our windmill, right? And when our windmill wasn't working properly, we didn't have water. So every once in a while, we'd be taking a shower or something like that, and the water would start to run low. And what I would hear is, Blade, windmill, right? So I'd have to go out to the windmill, and we'd built a little, you know, house or hut around it, and I'd have to go in there and prime the pump and, and get the water pumping again, right? But, but it was about 100 yards from our house. And that was before they created flashlights. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. But I didn't have one. Does that count for anything? I didn't have one. So it was a race. Me versus the demons that were chasing me. Right? So I would run as fast as I could out to the windmill. And whenever I got in there, I knew that I could pull a string and a light would come on and all of the fears would disappear because there was light. Did you know that in science, now, many people will say that science and the Word of God don't always mesh. I believe they do. I believe that the Word of God can explain everything that science can't answer. Did you know that in science, light is measurable? Darkness is not. Darkness is measured by the absence of light. What a great reminder that he who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. What a great reminder. Paul continues, live as people of the light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. That might be a challenge that you need to take up today. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Maybe it's time for some of us, Now I'm not pointing fingers or naming names or anything, but maybe it's time for some of us, even on social media, to stop sharing obscene things, to stop sharing things that don't align with God. Maybe it's time for some of us to stop getting so caught up in the things of this world and just focus on Jesus. Now, I know what you're thinking, Blade, you don't understand. Yes, I do. The Bible's pretty clear. Let there be no darkness among you. Live as a child of the light. He continues, carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. Whatever is exposed to the light is exposed. You don't, you don't even know what happens in the darkness, Paul says in other letters. It's shameful to even talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. It's shameful. Paul's like, I'm not even going to mention it. It's shameful. But their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines upon them. For the light makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. This is what's beautiful about following Jesus. 
And you hear me say this, but maybe it'll finally click right now. If Jesus is the light of the world, and we are his children, whenever we come to him, we have the opportunity to come with our fears, with our sins, with our anger. We have the opportunity to come to him with our doubts. You know why? Because with him being the light, he's going to expose all of it, but he's not going to leave us out in the light naked. He's going to wrap us and clothe us in his righteousness. Awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, quit hiding. How do you ever expect to heal if you keep hiding? So be careful how you live, Paul says. Be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. So what does this have to do with moving from more programs to more mission fields? You see, our mission at Christ Church is to multiply disciples through authentic relationship. I, like, sometimes it makes me uncomfortable the deep, dark things that I know about some of you. But here's what I know. If we stand in the light, it's all going to be all right. (laughs) Our mission is to multiply disciples through authentic relationships. We specifically do that by helping you discover your next steps to life in Christ. You see, Jesus in Matthew 4.19, I hope you never get tired of hearing this. He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. What's a disciple? Somebody that's actively following Jesus, someone that's constantly being changed by Jesus, and somebody that's relentlessly pursuing the mission of Jesus. And that is our mission, to make and multiply disciples. Let me tell you a stat that I read yesterday. And this is where I want to move from more programs to more mission fields. I read a statistic uh, that was put out in 2018. It studied over 10,000 churches. So I would think that this statistic has some weight to it. It's startling. It's extremely startling. The study was to uh, try to understand how many dollars it takes for one person to come to Jesus. Now, let me preface it with this. I would spend an infinity amount of dollars to bring one person to Jesus. And whenever that person comes to Jesus, all of heaven is rejoicing, and I will be rejoicing with them. But we start, uh, the, the study put forth this statistic, and let this startle you for a second. 10,000 churches, and through programs to bring one person to faith. You know how many dollars it took? One million. One million dollars? Are you kidding me? There has got to be a better way. Maybe, now forgive me here, maybe, just maybe, it's time for us to quit trying to do it our own way and just do it the way that Jesus told us to do it. Follow the example that he set out for us. We have learned over these last couple weeks that it's time to move from more effort to more Jesus. We don't need to try harder. We just need to proclaim and love like Jesus harder. We've learned that we need to move from more volunteers to more masterpieces. God has made each and every one of you as his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do the good things. Yeah, we have to do, right, to do the good things that he set out for us. We learned that we need to move from more guilt 
to more love. It's time to love like Jesus. We need to move from more hierarchy to more missionaries. God has given each and every one of us a mission field. And today, from more programs to more mission fields, is what I want to say is this. Each and every one of us have a masterpiece mission. I don't know what it is for you, but God does. I want to share a couple stories as I close here. Many of you know that I'm a huge Houston Astros fan. But I'm... (laughs) Really? Now, last night, we clinched the best record in the major leagues, which means that we now have home field advantage throughout all of the playoffs, which means the World Series comes through Houston. That's not what I want to talk about. There's a pitcher for the Detroit Tigers. His name is Matt Boyd. Now, Matt Boyd is a Christian. Matt Boyd is a millionaire. (laughs) Matt Boyd is a terrific pitcher, and he makes a lot of money. But Matt Boyd's a Christian, and he is not scared to share his faith. Do you know where the vast majority of Matt Boyd's salary goes? He and his wife, uh, around five years ago or so, came to a realization that sex trafficking in the world was a major, major problem. And it is. Major problem. So Matt Boyd and his wife came to an agreement I don't know the percentage, but that the vast majority of their salary and of their income would go to helping rescue people that are caught in sex trafficking, to give them counseling, to give them a home, to give them food, to give them whatever, like to give them a life, really. Matt Boyd's a millionaire. Probably most of us are not. But over the last several weeks, I've learned several stories. Had the opportunity to go to a Kansas City Royals versus Houston Astros game. Of course, the Astros won. But I got to go with my good friend, David. And on the way up there, he was expressing to me how grateful he is for his faith. Why? Because he gets to bring that to the law enforcement. What's his masterpiece mission? If he chooses to stay in law enforcement, he gets to be a shining light to the department. Over the last several years, I've, I've heard about how our good friend Buddy, who is now retired, got to share his faith on the line. The, the line? That's not, what is it? The, tell, the electric lines. And how he got to share his faith and be a light to there. I know that my father-in-law is a cattle rancher. And he gets to shine his light to the people around him. You guys, this is not difficult. Be a light where you are. So I want to launch something real quick. And this is how I want to close. Um... Whenever you walk out to the Welcome Center, I want to give you a challenge. I want to give you a challenge to be a light to your neighborhood. I want to give you a challenge that if you're able to walk around the homes next to you, and this does not have to be difficult, this is a good thing for you to be a missionary without having to talk to people unless you want to. I want to give you a challenge to walk around your neighborhood and pray for your neighbors. Maybe you know them, maybe you don't, but here's my challenge. I want you to walk in front of their house. I know Susan's going to do this. She walks all over the place. I want you to walk in front of their house, not necessarily even knock on their door unless you feel compelled to. And I want you to pray over your neighbor's homes. 
I want you to pray that they would be a person of peace. I want you to pray that they would know the love of Jesus. I want you to pray that they would know Jesus as Lord. And then I just want you to drop this thing on their doorknob. It simply says this. We prayed for you today. You don't have to sign it. You don't have to put your name on it. You don't have to do anything besides pray for your neighbors. That's the challenge. Now, here's the bigger challenge. We have a thousand of these. And we have until the end of October to go through all of them. So our October mission is to pray for our neighbors. That's the challenge. I'll share more about it in the coming weeks. Let's pray. Father, we lift up your name and we give you honor and praise and glory. We are so grateful today, Father, that we get to come before your presence among other believers. Father, we're grateful for this life that you have given us and we want to use it as a vessel for your glory. So I pray today, Father, that, uh, that you might challenge us in areas that we've never been challenged before that you might convict us in areas that we've not previously been convicted. I want to challenge, I want you to challenge us, Father, to take this new prayer initiative seriously, to love and serve and simply pray for our neighbors, not to get anything out of it, not necessarily even to grow the church, not to do anything but simply love our neighbors by praying for them. For your honor and for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen.